Welcome to the Startup Grind. So our speaker tonight is Kent Savage. He uh, is, at, is here out of the kindness of his heart to share his story. He's been doing, he's been working in the light therapy space for almost 30 years or more than 30 years. I'm sure he'll tell us about it. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, give it up for Kent Savage. I feel like I should give it up for everyone else. There's a lot of, a lot of great partners here and, and uh, family and friends. So thanks, everybody, for, for being here tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Kent. So I want to, so Kent, before showing up tonight, uh, he sent me a, a little bit of a brief about him. So I've got the inside scoop. And, and so I want to hear about sort of, you know, who the people are that, uh, <laughs> make you what you are today so go back you know through your family tree and tell us some stories okay i appreciate that i um i think i have some family members who really believe that entrepreneurship uh is uh, a genetic thing okay and, and uh, family members who believe it's a genetic defect okay and, uh, <laughs> and at times I think, I think my wife believes it's a genetic defect <laughs> Uh, so a grandfather, a uh, very successful surgeon, okay. uh, turned entrepreneur at the end of his at the end of his career. Uh -huh. uh, my father, who's been an entrepreneur, gave up a, a great pharmaceutical career to go into entrepreneurship okay. and startups. Uh, a bunch of brothers and uh, family members, of my generation, who have the defective gene, and then now my kids, I think. I think have that gene, and I'm not sure if it's for me if it's genetic or if it's environmental. Okay, it still still remains to be seen, but uh, a, a long family tree of, of entrepreneurship. I think uh, so. The gene, the mm -hmm. gene allows a couple of things. One, uh, I think the gene expresses itself in the ability to see it, a problem okay. that needs to be solved, and then number two to think of the, and, and devise the solution around the problem. And then the, the third thing is the defective part, and that is the belief that you can commercialize, you can actually commercialize the solution you've come up with. Okay. And uh, so I think um, entrepreneurship is awesome. The spirit of entrepreneurship is, you know, all, uh, it's the American dream. Right. And, uh, but you need a little bit more than that spirit to be successful, I think. Okay, that's fair. So, um, what is it that your grandpa started? Like, what did he do after, you know, being a surgeon? Well, he was really just involved more in investment than okay. anything. Uh, uh, one of the things that he went after was a, a cure for cancer. And I don't know how many years ago this was, mm -hmm. but a very dramatic, um, a very dramatic therapy for cancer that was being done in Europe. He took patients. He took. He went over and saw, and then he brought. Uh, he was living in the Seattle area, I believe, and he brought uh, people he knew who had cancer. Yep. They went to Europe, they received treatment, and their cancer improved. Wow. And uh, so he was, uh, he was going after that. And I can't remember what happened with that story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, medically based kind of things. Okay. He, he sort of sets the stage. Uh, there's certainly a, a medical thread yeah. uh, from you know, your grandfather being a surgeon your father doing the pharmaceuticals, uh, and yourself. And so when you were young, what were some of your thoughts about, you know, when you imagine yourself where you are today, what did you see and what's different than who you are today from what you saw as a child? I'm much skinnier today. Oh, okay. <laughs> salary, I think. Um, so uh, I saw, you know, up front and close, uh, mm -hmm. personal as my dad, uh, started many startups, most of which didn't go anywhere. Right. Um, and uh, he would employ his kids as uh, the manual labor for those startups okay. oftentimes. And um, so I learned a lot of a lot of great lessons and learned how hard it was mm -hmm. and the sacrifices that it took to to actually do a startup. Um, and but I learned a lot of ingenuity. Um, one of the things that uh, we did we did a lot of piecework. And um, so the, the faster we did the work, we, the more we got paid. Okay. And, and we, were, we were earning money for bikes and, and for whatever, and for college, and uh, we didn't want to be there. 
Um, so we learn to work fast and hard and, and come up with ways to improve the process okay. so that we could, we could do it faster. Um, and I, I think the real, my real focus of, uh, I always wanted to start a business and hire great people and provide a great lifestyle for people. That was really kind of, kind of my dream. Cool. So when you, um, you know, what was your first venture ever? You said you were working for your dad, but what was like a, a, an original idea that you started w that you can remember being the first one that you kind of identified as being entrepreneurial? Well, again, I think the process is inside my dad's, my okay. dad's company. So um, we were, again, we were the manual labor. Yeah. We were the manual labor. And, and I, I remember uh, we had a process of, of putting um, material into bottles uh -huh. and coming up with a new way to actually use the funnel and the spoon and, and, and what was going in the bottles all together to make that happen. Cool. So, um, you know, it was, it was just so we could get out of work faster. Sure. Whatever, whatever the trick is. <laughs> okay. So, um, ultimately you decided to go and get a, pursue a higher education. Uh, what did you choose to study and why? Okay, so uh, interesting, um, going into college, I actually um, was headed towards physical therapy. Okay. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed life sciences and uh, enjoyed the hard sciences and uh, went on a, an LDS mission okay. and, uh, and went to Argentina and enjoyed that experience. I fell in love with the Spanish language and I came back and taught Spanish. Uh, and throughout, as a part-time job throughout uh, my schooling, okay. and uh, changed majors when I decided I didn't want to be a physical therapist, and uh, and did a degree in Spanish literature of all things, all right. uh, because I enjoyed it, and um, and then also um, had a minor in international relations, okay. um, which which isn't very marketable. <laughs> and so when you discovered that, uh, what? <laughs> What did you do? Well, I knew I, I knew I needed to go back sometime and, and get a and get another degree. And was that always the plan to no. get a master's level? No, <laughs> no, it wasn't. But I, I, you know, school of hard knocks taught me that that I needed to do that. Fair enough. Okay. So you came back, and I saw that uh, you got your MBA from BYU, um, and then you know, tell me. So right now, I am approaching my last semester in my master's program at BYU. So I'm very much at this point in your story. And uh, I'm doing a startup with three classmates. So why don't you give me some personal advice with you know, that relationship, uh, how important that is that you've seen. Uh, what would you tell me right now? OK, I, I would say go for it. I'm, 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 sorry, I'm ready to invest, actually. Great. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your talent. but. Um, uh, I just I have to plug BYU. It's a great program, sure. and um, there are great people in the mm -hmm. program. And uh, I, the first night of our experience, um, one of the directors said, "The relationships that you will build in this program will uh, will be a part of your career for the rest of your life." And I and I really didn't understand that. Sure. Uh, but since that time, um, I've worked with a lot of. Classmates. Okay. Uh, I hired a number of classmates, which is something we never imagined would happen. And uh, I would say, uh, take advantage of uh, understand your own skill set, uh -huh. understand your own strengths and your own weaknesses, and surround yourself with the people who have the skill sets that you don't have, and uh, stick with those BYU grads. Okay. So, was it weird hiring your classmates? Like, was there ever, like, was oh, that kind of weird that kind of uh, No, it wasn't weird, but, um, you know, it, it was amazing that it actually happened. So, you know, the, the business started from, you know, ground zero. My father, my father self-funded the business up front, and uh, we had a lot of lean years. And mm -hmm. very inter interesting for me, anyway, was when I started my program, our corporate offices were, uh, it was kind of in a, an area of town that was the manufacturing area of town. Okay. And we, we did have an office, and the rest was, was kind of shop area. Uh -huh. And uh, 
we had four people that worked in the one office. We shared the one office. We shared the one bathroom. And I, I'm sure it was eight by 10, if not smaller. I'm not wow. sure. And you know, we had four of us sitting <laughs> on the phone and whatever. And, and we had a study group come once to my office to, to uh, oh, do wow. a little work. And these were all guys that came from corporate settings. Okay. Right? And first of all, when we, we drove into that area of town, they looked at me like, really? <laughs> And, uh, and then when they saw the, the office, uh -huh. they, uh, they about left. Uh, and, they, and they just shook their heads. They couldn't believe that, that you ran a company out of that kind of space. And uh, within a couple of years, uh, we were successful enough, and we were in Class A office space, uh -huh. partly to attract uh, acquisition. Okay. And uh, we were at a place in, in growth where we needed some talent. And fortunately, some of those classmates were at a place in their career where they could join us. And, uh, and uh, I was so excited. And, and really, uh, the talent that we had at the time and then those additional classmates uh, enabled us to get the acquisition. We needed so the talent. It wasn't just like, you know, during school and after, you know, immediately after school that you hired these guys. It's like your paths crossed later on and they brought the experiences from industry and, and to a, was it Apollo Light Systems at the right. time? So what was the mission of Apollo Light Systems? Well, Apollo Light was uh, delivering a product for sleep and mood disorders. Okay. And uh, we had grown that business from, from zero. You know, the first year revenue was $50,000 total revenue for one year. Wow. And um, so not a lot of profit there. And, um, and, uh, the idea was to take a solution for sleep and depression, a something that was non-invasive, mm -hmm. that was that uh, would reduce the medication load and allow people to enjoy uh, a happy uh, lifestyle without having to take the medication. So it sounds like deal. I'm ready to buy it. Yeah, you should. And, and anyone here, you know, we're no longer involved with that company, but uh, they're great. Therapy is very effective. So who? How did you come up with this idea, or whose idea was it? Well, so, um, again, it was founded by my father. Uh, uh -huh. This was actually a pivot that he was able to do. So he, he had a, a technology that, uh, and a different market space. He, was, um, he, he had a device that was treating psoriasis. Okay. It was a UV light therapy full body panel. Mm -hmm. And he was selling that uh, to psoriasis treatment centers. He went to the U of U to make a sales call uh, up at the U of U psoriasis treatment center. They told him about research that was being done in the mood disorders clinic at the U uh, using light. And so mm -hmm. he went over and introduced himself and, and quickly realized that the technology that he had would be a great, uh, a great foundational piece for this, this light therapy for depression. And they were in the first clinical trials it was a multi-national, a multi-center uh, trial being done in the United States, and uh, he realized this technology would work. He, uh, over a short period of time, convinced the the uh, psychiatrist up at the U at the Mood Disorders Center that it was a great idea. Yep. They they loaned him money. Wow. And um, he's a good salesman. Yeah, he's a great salesman, and uh, with with the help of friends and, and family, he, he launched that company. Okay, so it sounds like that not only are you taking advantage of BYU, you're also going to milk the U of U for... Absolutely. Okay. You know, my, grand, my grandfather... <laughs> Got to put a plug for that. Yeah, yes. absolutely. U of U is a, is a great, a great innovative center. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for, you know, the nation's best, really. Yeah. And um, love the people at the U. Uh, that's uh, where my grandfather got his, his uh, medical degree at okay. the University of Utah. So, so can you explain the someone like myself who has never, you know, I've never dealt with light systems or uh, light therapy at all. Can you explain to the layman sort of like, how does it work? Great. So light therapy, uh, the effect of light therapy comes through the eye. Okay. So you, um, interestingly, your retina, uh, as you develop, um, as a fetus, your your retina is actually deep brain tissue and it extends out of your deep brain. So the cells in your retina are very similar to the cells in your brain. Okay. And there are neurological pathways there other than visual pathways. 
So there are lots of connections between your eye and your brain. Some of them are physical and some of them are, are chemical. And um, so you can affect, your, actual, your eyes are, are really the, uh, the thermostat for your brain. And you can, you can affect your, the, the chemistry of your eye, so the neurotransmitters that are in your eye, the cells that are in your eye, mm -hmm. and they, act, they send a signal to your brain. Um, you can, uh, by, by uh, changing uh, the chemistry of your eye, you actually change the chemistry of, of your brain. And all of that understanding has really come to light in probably the last 15 years. Okay. We, knew that, we knew that light therapy was working. Yeah. You know, it, the, the whole light therapy idea came around because people uh, who had depression in the wintertime knew that in the summer they didn't. Mm -hmm. They knew that if they went to Florida, they felt better. Yep. Um, they slept better. And this was before Disneyland, though. This was before Disneyland. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> and uh, so it's not just the beach, but it's actually the sunlight. Yeah. And um, and so they knew light worked. And so the first the first inter, uh, inventions were around making light like sunlight. Mm -hmm. And then as science progressed and they understood what was actually happening in the eye and how to affect that chemistry of the eye, then you could uh, refine the product and uh, and go after specific chemistries by specific wavelengths. That's fascinating. So at Apollo, you said that you moved to some you know class A office space to attract uh, you know your next step, which was acquisition. What other elements did you put in place to you know try to get acquired? Well. Um, it was just our really our, our sales model. We moved from we were moving from a a um, direct sales model uh -huh. to retail sales. So part of the the uh, under the scientific understanding was driving driving awareness in the industry. Yeah. And uh, we were beginning to have retail sales. Mm -hmm. And so all of the infrastructure that was needed for that re retail sales channel and to, to support our retail partners. Um, and so uh, additional, additional manufacturing overseas, um, uh, additional marketing right. and sales staff, and we continued always. The strength of our company was really always the, the, uh, the relationship we had with researchers. And uh, so we maintained that and grew those relationships. My father had started those you know, with his background in pharmaceutical sales. Mm -hmm. He had a great he had great relationships throughout the industry with the, with the leading researchers. We supported their research, and, and by staying close to them, we were close to innovation, and we would we would learn about the innovation, be a part of the innovation, and be able to adapt that into our product, get IP around the innovations that mm -hmm. we were driving, and uh, and that IP piece was real real important because. Light was ubiquitous at first, mm -hmm. um, and there, there was no IP to be had. And so as we, we understood the neurochemistry of the eye, and we understood the wavelengths that were affecting that neurochemistry, we were able to uh, capture some IP around that, and, and that IP uh, gave us some protection that allowed us to be acquired. So when you mentioned that you have to sort of educate the market, you know, that's something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs face. You know, they've got some competitive advantage, but they need to, you know, demonstrate that to the customer. Was there anything particularly creative or uh, a technique you used besides, you know, deep pockets uh, that you found to be effective? Well, we didn't have deep pockets, so that wasn't an option. Great. Um, uh, you know, really, it was, first of all, I would, I would give the advice, if you have to educate the marketplace, don't do it. Because okay. <laughs> it's so painful, um, but you, you do in in every in every business. Yeah. Um, uh, but if it's too big of a challenge, be aware of that. Yeah. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, my, my the founding partner of our of our new company, Dan Adams, mm -hmm. came came into the business about halfway through, and he brought a marketing expertise that was. Uh, first, uh, marketing to professionals. Okay. And so establishing the marketing first to key opinion leaders, mm -hmm. and then using those relationships to, to go to the general public was, was really uh, what we did. And a, a lot of what we did at first was without the internet. 
No, right? This is, we're old and I'm old enough. Sorry. I think the internet was around when you were born. Probably, oh, yeah. But um, the first things we did, you know, we were we were at conventions, okay, um, talking to doctors and, and making a difference with kids and leaders. Um, so take us to the next uh, consideration. So uh, you got acquired. Was there anything tricky? Uh, you had your IP in place. Um, you know, what do I need to be aware of if I'm about to go through that situation? Well, um, there are lots of lots of pitfalls. Sure. Uh, and I, I don't know if I can identify even close to all of them. We were fortunate that the company that acquired us, it was a, a, a billion dollar uh, sleep company um, who was being at that time acquired by Philips. So okay. uh, commonly known as Philips Respironics. Um, and um, they had, we were acquired by their venture arm, uh -huh. which was a nice thing because they understood venture. Yeah. And um, they had done a lot of acquisitions recently, so they had a team that understood acquisitions, they had a team that understood uh, culture, okay. process, and those kind of things. Um, there was another company <coughs> that they bought within months of our company, and uh, uh, we were able to, to keep our entire staff Wow. through a couple of year period and I thought that was a great a great success and this other company went through what you would you might normally expect they lost about half their staff yeah. and uh, uh, I think being able to adapt and, and going into it with wide open eyes uh, understanding that it's no longer no longer you're no longer driving uh -huh. the entity and being willing to be grateful for what they bring and, uh, and then also uh, continue innovation. Um, large companies, they, they buy small companies because they can innovate. Yeah. And the large companies are having difficulties innovating, so keeping that innovation alive within your organization, I think, is critical. Okay. Um, well, it's, I think there's a, a, in particular, you talked about being able to keep all of your employees um, yeah, I think people resist change. Did you deal with resistance from your employees at all? Is this idea that, hey, we might be acquired soon? Uh, were there challenges there with the perception of the being acquired? Uh, yes and no. I think um, everyone understood that that was the objective. Okay. So going into it. And That's also, good. I think a, a, a real key element that I would recommend to everybody is um, you know your key employees you give them opportunities to uh, gain equity okay and so our key employees had equity and and so it was the the idea of being acquired was also a win for them and I think that's that's essential and, and oft times there's a burnout period or oft yeah. times there's stock that's involved that that you have to make the company successful and so having your key employees involved in a stock uh, option plan or a stock plan, I think is, is important. Awesome. So you, so let's go to the next chapter yeah. of your story with, uh, so you have the acquisition happen, everyone's happy, you know, we all get a big paycheck. What do you turn around and do then? Buy a nice car. That's right. <laughs> no. um, uh, it was interesting because um, as Philips kind of took control of the entity that they were acquiring and, and us at the same time, uh -huh. uh, the Philips business model is, is completely different uh, than what we were used to. It's a very unique model where they have, they have international pieces of business. They don't have small uh, businesses with all the business functions. Mm -hmm. They just don't own small businesses with business functions. What they do is they they uh, have international business functions. So they have marketing in, in Stanford, Connecticut that markets a wide variety of, of all of Philips products and they market to North America. Okay. Uh, and um, all of their product development is done in the Netherlands. They have uh, 2,500 people at one site in the Netherlands doing product development for a whole range of product offerings. Okay. And so this little, this little entity wasn't going to survive. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, so over a couple of year period of time, I, we were very proud of our team because we grew the business during that period of time and uh, we were very successful in taking the different business uh, sectors of our business and, and transferring them into the Phillips organization in a seamless way, in a successful way. And some of our people went with those. Okay. And, uh, and so that was a good thing for them. So now, when do we get to the, uh, your next idea? How long were you able to sit still without you know, feeling the entrepreneur's itch again? Well, I, uh, I never did. Okay. So it was just, so you walked out of the door and you felt it. Um, so I did some consulting for a period of time. Uh -huh. And then, again, uh, our, my founding partner um, uh, came to me with the concept of, of uh, a new therapy, mm -hmm. a light therapy, with different wavelengths of light and different intensities for Parkinson's disease. Okay. So again, uh, it was one of those research relationships that we had that came to us and uh, knew that we were capable of, of taking a new idea and commercializing the idea. Yeah. And uh, we had supported him through thick and thin, yeah. and so he came to us and, and asked us if we would if we were interested in doing that with him. So, how have things been accelerated because of the existing relationships from Apollo Light Systems, and the, you know you sort of know the industry a lot better than you did when you started Apollo. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I, I think critical for us have, have been the, the partners, the okay. outside partners. I, I, I um, haven't mentioned yet, but our, our entire Apollo team, we, we uh, did $10 million of business and we had 12 employees. Wow. And so we were outsourcing a lot of our work. And uh, right now we have two employees Dang. And, um, and we're outsourcing. Okay. So those those partnerships, those industry partnerships, are critical for us. Okay. Uh, we have a lot. Uh, some of those people here tonight. Um, we're manufacturing. You know, we don't manufacture our own product. Sure. Uh, we have a third party that's doing that for us. We have Biomerics here tonight that's doing our medical device manufacturing. We have Rocket Ship here, who mm -hmm. we've been working with for a long time. Okay. From Provo, uh, doing our our industrial design work. Um, uh, our attorneys. You know that we've used in the past um, our uh, our financial people, yeah. uh, fulfillment people, all sorts of industry uh, people that uh, because we had good relationships, um, either they give it, they connect us to others, or or we have automatic a place to turn to for the expertise that we need that we don't have that we hire out. Okay, so now with the uh, life sciences business, um, you know, there are challenges with raising equity there because the return doesn't come as quick. Can you share a little bit of insight of, you know, is it just that it doesn't, because historically it hasn't come quickly, so it's just harder to get money, or, um, you know, describe your experience with, you know, raising funding. Yeah, we had, we actually had a great experience, and uh, there are lots of good reasons for that, but you know, Salt Lake is a, is a great hub for innovation. Yeah. It's a great hub for life science innovation, so there are life science investors here. Okay. Um, not a lot, um, but more than in a lot of places around the country. Okay. You, know, you, have, you have the two coasts, you have Boston, and you have San Francisco, Bay Area, and that's about it. And yeah. uh, uh, Salt Lake City has some great, has some great uh, angel and, vet and uh, venture folks that are, that are willing to do life science investments. The thing about life science is that it, it is a long run, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a pretty risky run, uh, but it can pay off really well. And I, I think, I was thinking about this earlier this afternoon, I think the, the life science investor has to have a feeling of, hey, I want to change the world. Yeah. Uh, you want a great return, but you, you also have some intrinsic uh, desire to, to make a difference. And um, uh, the, it's it's difficult because it's a long it's a long cycle. You start with basic science. Yep. You do animal models. You do translational work into human models, and then you do clinical trials. And and then you know does your clinical trial work? Yeah. And um, and so it's it's risky business. And um, we've 
I think the, the main reason why we were successful was because we're far along that path. So, so where, where are you today? So, so before the investment, okay. um, the, the animal model, the, the basic science was done, the mm -hmm. animal models done, the translational work was done, and there was some good human trial data already. Okay. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't an official trial, it was people being treated by a doctor in Australia. So there have been people treated and successfully treated in, in incredible, incredible changes in their Parkinson's disease, never before seen. And so that story we're able to take to investors and, and they know that now our, do, our job is to uh, finalize, refine the product and uh, take it to a clinical trial, mm -hmm. run a successful clinical trial and then take the market. So you're, you're finding great results still and, um, and so what's your go-to-market plan once you finish with the clinical trials? We hope we never go to market. How's that? Okay. We hope we're acquired. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> we can another new car. <laughs> I have one. And it's getting old. Okay. It's been seven years since that acquisition. So, um, uh, so anyway, um, we can take it to market, and we have the, we have the experience to take it to market. We believe, however, that the results of the clinical trial are going to be dramatic enough that we won't have an opportunity to take it to market. That's, that's our hope. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it's just making a tremendous difference in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is a, is a very, very difficult disease, mm -hmm. as you probably know. And um, Can you describe some yeah, of the cases? Yeah, so uh, first of all, the prevalence of Parkinson's um, in, an, in elderly, it, it's, a, it's about 1% okay. of elderly people have Parkinson's disease. There are a million, million patients in the United States. There's 70,000 new patients every year. Okay. The demographics show that Parkinson's disease will double in the next 15 to 20 years. So it's a disease that really needs some attention. Yeah. Um, there is no cure for Parkinson's disease, and there is no long-term effective treatment right now. Mm -hmm. So the medications that you take for Parkinson's uh, are very helpful symptomatically for the first few years, but the disease continues to progress. Okay. And people require more and more medication and um, until the medication actually becomes worse than the disease itself, the side effects from the medication mm -hmm. actually become neurotoxic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, patients are taking all sorts of medications. They're taking medication for sleep, for depression, for anxiety. Mm -hmm. They're taking medication for their movement disorder. They're taking medication to help the medication that they're taking for their movement disorder. It's a really, really tough disease. And, yeah. and there just really isn't uh, any um, new innovation that's, that's promising in the next you know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, all the new medications that are coming on board, they're, they're the same, they're similar medications and a little bit better delivery. Okay. They make it a little more convenient, to make their lifestyle a little bit better, um, but there's no, no disruptive therapy out there. And uh, we're seeing patients with long-term improvement and continued long-term improvement. Awesome. And um, and that's never been seen before in Parkinson's yeah. treatment, long-term. So the data we have uh, before our clinical trial is the average is four years. Patients are um, continue to get better, and they're taking less medication. That's great. That's never been seen before in Parkinson's treatment. So it's very promising. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to be done still, a lot to be understood. Uh, and so, you know, the, the round of funding that we did is focused on, on conducting a successful clinical trial. So okay. we need the, the data, the early data is just from treating people in a clinic. And so we need, we need controlled clinical data to be able to tell a validated story and to, and to validate that our product is safe and effective. And so how many, um, what, what size does your trial have to be in order to be statistically significant? Um, that's a great question. It has to do uh, with a lot of uh, different inputs. Mm -hmm. And um, our trial is going to be 80 to 100 patients. Yeah. We're recruiting right now for that trial. That's awesome. And, um, and it depends on how significant the statistics are. Yeah. Right? So if the data comes back as strong as our pre-trial our, our pre data 
it will be uh, more than strong enough. Okay. We think it will be strong enough for the FDA to couldn't turn us down. Yep. One thing is that the product is safe, right? The FDA considers this, and, and uh, the European community considers this a non-significant risk device. It's just yeah. simply a safe device. So you have to prove safety and efficacy. And there's a threshold for safety, and a threshold for efficacy. And if your safety is high, then, then your efficacy is actually lower. But we think we're going to blow that out of the water. Awesome. All right, everyone, let's give it up one more time for Chen. So I'm going to give uh, the audience a chance if you have any questions. We probably have time for three questions. So uh, if you'd like to, I'll bring you a mic. I work with a lot of seniors, and a number of them are suffering with Parkinson's. And what percentage of the 1% of the population, of the senior population that has Parkinson's, are aware of this technology and have access to it right now? Zero percent. has <laughs> It's pretty close to zero. But first of all, no one has access to it in the United States or, or in Europe, anywhere in the world, really. There's a doctor. A doctor can practice medicine um, wherever he wants. It's part of being a doctor. And uh, yet we cannot make a device for that treatment. You know, we're regulated. We can't make a device. So uh, we've, we've learned over time, you know, the doctor in Australia has been treating people, and over time he's been... He's been coming up with a, uh, a recipe of specific wavelengths that are most effective. And, and actually, we believe that he's found uh, wavelengths of light, visual light, that, are, that could be detrimental. And so um, the therapy is simply not available. And, um, and, uh, but we do refer people to the clinical trial. So um, if people are interested in becoming part of the clinical trial, we have a trial site here in in uh, Salt Lake City, just outside of Salt Lake City, with Aspen Clinical Research, they're a great research team. We're at Harvard, so if someone's around the Boston area, they're uh, beginning to recruit at Harvard, and then we're also in Amsterdam. So people can be involved in the clinical trial, and other than that, we, we can't make it available. And interestingly, now that we've developed the product, and refined the product, and we're taking it to the clinical trial, um, uh, our business focus is now general awareness. And so during the trial, we're gonna spend some time working with key opinion leaders and start getting the, the pre-clinical trial data out there, what's published out there, to start seeding, seeding the, the marketplace professionally and then individuals so that people are ready for the therapy once it comes to market. Other questions? For those of us maybe less familiar with life sciences, do you mind giving a, an overview again of the different phases that a startup goes through and maybe digging into, uh, to, to, you raised an interesting question before I was unfamiliar with, but the typical time spent in each of those phases, and then to the extent you're familiar, maybe like the success and failure rates. There are probably some people in the room can tell you the success and failure rates better than I could. I really don't know about the rates. Um, but the basic steps are, you know, it's the basic science first. A lot of that's done in a lab, depending on, on what the uh, invention is. But basic science, and then typically they take that basic science and apply it to an animal model. They find an animal model that's similar uh, to a human model uh, for the specific thing they're going after. Um, and then after that animal model, then they do translational research, which is applying uh, what they learned with animals into a, into a limited human subset, and then and then a full blown uh, clinical human clinical trial, and um, most m most uh, uh, invention doesn't get to the human clinical trial. I know that. I I don't know the percentages. One last question, or not? I'm interested in your decision the second time around to not have as many employees. Uh, the first, the first, uh, all the life systems you had a, a larger, not that large, but you had you had more employees, you had more more of a team, you're doing a lot more things yourself. Here, you're doing a lot of things, or you're letting other people do a lot of the work for you. Why, why did you make that decision? Can you 
tell us a little about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's simply efficiencies and, and also where we are in the business. So with Apollo, we could go to market immediately because if, if we made the right claims, it wasn't regulated by the FDA. So if we're careful about our, we were, if we were careful about our language, then we didn't need an FDA approval. And, um, and so we could go to market. So there was a need for you know, a different subset of, of people in the organization. And now, because this is definitely a, a, um, a clinical diagnosis and something that needs to go through regulatory, the you know, stringent regulatory processes, they're just, they're, we're just simply going after such a small subset of the business first um, that we don't need the employees. But as we get closer to go to market, then you know the business plan shows of hiring, hiring other other pieces of the business. All right, one last um, oh, one last question is what I mean. Yeah, let's uh, let's go back to Apollo right? Systems. So it wasn't wasn't regulated or within that purview where it would need to be regulated. But are there sometimes strategic reasons why you would want to step it up and? Absolutely. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, when we were being acquired, we were in that process, right? So part of it's barrier to entry. And in fact, the FDA, uh, in this instance, uh, was very familiar with the therapy, and they wanted someone to step up and, and uh, make a difference, right? Uh, so that in some ways it could be regulated, because when it's not regulated, you get a lot of a lot of things happening that are outside of real good clinical practice. Uh, we were always very strong with our, our clinical trials, but a, a lot of industry isn't. And so um, they wanted some regulation, and we were in the middle of, of actually applications to the FDA for strategic reasons, so for barriers of entry and, and uh, where we had some IP, and then to add on you know, an FDA approval would, would really make us the only game in town. Let's give a big thanks to Cam on my side.